So we're now entering into 2024 and memories of the Kickstarter MMORPGs from the mid-2010s are now long a thing of the past. But what happened to many of those MMORPGs that seemed at the time to be the subject of so much drama, debate, discussion, and hype? Doing research for this video made me realize just how absolutely dire the state of most of these Kickstarter and or player-backed MMORPGs is at the moment, and just maybe MMORPGs in general. But enough introductions, let's get into the video. But before we do, I want to make a bit of a disclaimer. Let's be blunt. Kickstarter MMOs have, at least in general, turned out over all these years to be a complete fiasco, at least most of the time. There are a few odd exceptions. So if I'm critical of a game that you like or are still hyped about or that you backed, it's not because I'm trying to destroy the dream of your beloved new MMORPG. It's because I'm genuinely concerned for consumers and I tend to be critical of the way developers have behaved in Kickstarter games in general. While researching this video, I came across a comment on City of Titans' uh, Kickstarter page. And whether true or not, you can never really tell on the internet these days, this comment was the sort of thing that really does concern me about Kickstarters, the way people get hyped for them, the investment both emotionally and monetarily they make. The comment was by Randy Wilson, who wrote, I am one of the original donors to this project, namely City of Titans, from somewhere around 2013. I had high hopes, and not having any experience in game development, I trusted the person who was asked for donations, who declared the game would be ready in a year. How wrong I was. I have waited all this time, and still, all we can do is tour an uninhabited city. Now I have Merkel cell carcinoma and will probably not be able to play the game at all because my life expectancy is now under three years. So very disappointed in this project. And like the sad, dark truth of that comment is that uh, none of our life expectancies will be long enough for a lot of these Kickstarter games to ever play them. But I just wanted to tell people, like, you know, if I seem uh, aggressive about some of my commentary on these projects, it's coming from a place of, of commitment to consumer ethics and uh, not from a place of just trying to hate on uh, hate on your favorite game. But enough, enough of the lengthy introduction. Let's get into it with Crowfall. Crowfall was kickstarted back in 2015, easily meeting its Kickstarter goals and selling itself as a PvP-focused MMORPG. Right, now wait there. When I say you fly to the target... When I dial this, you go to heaven, Brother Crow. Piecing together the history of Crowfall's development is a video in and of itself, but it was originally sold, and to its fans at least, as the successor to Shadowbane, but it would mix together traditional elements of an MMORPG with a larger focus on crafting and survival aspects. For my viewers nowadays, think a mix of rust in terms of servers and an emphasis on base building combined with a more traditional MMORPG. The game was released on July 6, 2021, being universally panned by critics from every direction. The game barely lasted a year, and it was taken offline on November 22, 2022, to the disappointment of its fans, but to the knowledge of almost no one. In fact, I only found out about this later. If it wasn't for the day before, Crowfall would probably still hold the record for speed running an MMO to complete failure. The reasons given for the game's speedy demise were its clunky combat, its lack of advertising. Heck, I didn't even notice the game was out until I happened to randomly see a YouTube video about it. Combine that with the fact that the fundamental design of the game was, well, weird. I mean, why would I play an MMORPG that resets like a survival game? The two genres are completely at odds. In MMORPGs, it's about commitment to your character and that character's progression in the world. In games like Rust, everything is fleeting and transient, and the fun of the drama comes from that conflict. No one would want the drama of a game like Rust if it was permanent, but no one would want World of Warcraft if it was always momentary. A fundamentally flawed game, in my opinion, that got KO'd by reality pretty quickly. Though I do feel sorry for its backers, but heck. Given how poorly they marketed the game, I bet a lot of the backers forgot that they ever funded the game in the first place and probably didn't even notice any of this happened after all that time. And next up on this list, we have City of Titans. A brief mention here goes to the often ignored City of Titans. It was penned as the successor to the much-loved City of Heroes, and it was kickstarted all the way back in 2013, 
to the tune of almost 700,000 US dollars. Basically one of the earliest games to get kickstarted as an MMO on that website. Researching this game was difficult as it seems no one really cared besides a small dedicated group of fans. And now as of 2024, the game has still not released. Though a trailer has recently come out that I'll put on screen now. If you know anything about the Unreal Engine and are watching what I hope I have edited and put on screen now, it's pretty clear that over a decade, I think 11 years precisely as of now, this game looks like a bunch of Unity assets chalked together and thrown on a screen. One can only wonder where the almost $700,000 went over that time. I can imagine. I'd rather play the currently quite popular City of Heroes private servers, which are actually awesome, and I was going to make a more positive video on them soon because they're quite fun. And I think that they more or less spelled the end of this horrible failed Kickstarter, but it hasn't stopped them from releasing a trailer in 2024, so we'll never know really, will we? I mean, it's been over a decade. But things don't get better at all with our next entry. And I need to take a deep breath before I start this one. Give me a second. Chronicles of Illyria. What can you say that hasn't been said about Chronicles of Illyria? Okay, let's slow it down. For people that don't know, the game raised $1.3 million back in 2016 as a small indie studio with a few employees that promised to make a game that had land ownership. Characters that would age and die as part of a persistent dynasty that grew in power over time. Basically, if you think something is mind-blowing and innovative that could be in a medieval MMORPG, Chronicles of Valeria was going to do it, and it was going to do it for only $1.3 million with a small indie studio. Obviously, that sounds stupid now, but over a decade ago, people were dumb. The development of the game went absolutely nowhere, with trailers constantly changing quality as the game got closer to its quote-unquote release date, with the initial pre-rendered scenes dwarfed by a scruffy-looking small indie game that looked like garbage. By 2020, when the virus hit big time, the studio was shuttered, but infamously, that didn't stop its developer claiming large sums from the U.S. taxpayer to fund the studio through the crisis, even though by his own admission... The game was no longer under development because they had run out of funding at that point. But that's a discussion for Joe Biden. By the end of the crisis, the studio would shut and saying, as I already mentioned, it had ran out of funds. This would cause a class action lawsuit by its backers in 2022, which would eventually fail. Now, I've done another video talking about this class action lawsuit very briefly and saying how it shows that I think lawyers don't really understand how Kickstarter MMO RPGs work. And if they did understand them better, they would be more successful in suing them. Uh, I really think a lot of these companies could be sued, but lawyers, lawyers are busy people. They work 90 hours a week. They don't know how Kickstarter MMO RPGs work because they're not, uh, yeah, that's not their thing. Anyways, the lawsuit failed. It is an important thing to note about this game that compared to the other games where the backers were largely supporting the game out of love for the project, Chronicles of Lyria promised big, and I mean big, in game rewards for backers. From being kings and dukes and owning large stretches of land to the backers sitting around and role-playing their bought royalty in a Discord server over a decade. So when I say that people felt scammed, I mean people felt scammed. It wasn't just the Kickstarter money. It was a bizarre clique of people who got very angry because they thought they were paying to win in the most aggressive way possible. I think we've all met some of them. I've spoken in other videos about how I think the lawyers in this suit made various mistakes, and I'm not going to hash it out here, as I've already said. But I do think that had these, this lawsuit been rephrased in a more intelligent way by the lawyers knowing more about actual game development, it probably could have gone a lot further. But who am I to judge? I'm just a PhD dropout. After beating the lawsuit, the game's developer decided to do what we will see a lot of game development studios in this list do, which is to make a different game and say that that was the game that was crowdfunded. This will be attempted multiple times in this list. Uh, and release a small Unity-based city builder similar to the Banished games that look like absolute garbage. Uh, yeah, that's it. That's that's what they did. Um, a bit of a side note here, the game's Wikipedia page still lists it as releasing in 2024, but the link to the article that the game cites as a source is doesn't imply any such thing. It's fishy. Chronicles of Lyria. Just Google it. 
I mean, it's well discussed. I could not if if I were if I were to go into detail about all the scandals that have, go, have faced Chronicles of Valyria, uh, this video would be like two hours long. Safe to say, not going to come out soon. Safe to say sued. Safe to say bad. Moving on. And next we have a game that is actually kind of okay. That is Temtem. Temtem was meant as a Pokemon-style MMORPG. However, in reality, it's more like playing Pokemon with a lot of other players on the screen. It was kickstarted back in 2018 to the tune of around 600000 US dollars. The game is actually one of the few in this video to have actually released. Initial reviews were very positive, and I actually myself played quite a bit of the game on launch. It wasn't as good as playing Pokemon, which was a bit of a letdown, but it was fun nonetheless. In recent years, however, the game has added a very aggressive cash shop, or at least the cash shop has been perceived to be aggressive by its players, and support for the game has steadily and radically decreased now, and while it did release and people did enjoy and play it, the game, I think it's safe to say, doesn't have a good reputation now anymore than a lot of these other Kickstarters, because that just seems to be the trend of funding Kickstarters in the 2010s. But now let's get on to one that particularly pains me. Next up, we have Shroud of Avatar. A uh, entry that's particularly painful for me. Not that I was naive enough to back it, mind you, after what happened with Tabula Rasa. Which is an, a story for another time. God, this whole video is just full of stories for another time. Uh, if you want any one of those particular stories, comment below. And I'll try and focus on that for one of my next videos if I get around to it. Shroud of Avatar was kickstarted back in 2013. One of the first big titles that hit the Kickstarter scene along with things like City of Titans. And it started this wave of nonsense and copium. The game raised almost $2 million US in large part due to its project lead being Ultima game designer Richard Garriott. The game was positioned in large part as a sequel to the famous Ultima Online after the original Ultima Online 2 was cancelled, with an in-depth skill system and crafting similar to the Ultima game, albeit placed in a 3D world. The game did eventually release in 2018 to absolutely mediocre reviews, with many people commenting that its traditional take on the Ultima skill system in combat did not function at all well in the modern era, and that in general, Richard Garriott didn't know how to design a modern game at all and hadn't bothered to learn. This combined with the fact that the game heavily was reliant on backers and microtransactions to buy houses and land, something that in the original Ultima could easily be bought in-game and had no real-world trading stuff, I mean, other than buying stuff on eBay. I mean, you can always real-world trade on eBay in games. But in general, that stuff wasn't a part of the original Ultima games, whereas uh, in Shrouded Avatar uh, is the biggest pay-to-win farce I've ever seen. As the game launched, there was also a big resurgence of private servers for the original Ultima Online, which only served to help starve the game of its small player base because now they could play the original Ultima Online, much improved by developers that were doing it for free and out of a passion for the game, and they weren't being exploited by a company that just wanted their money. I mean, not that private servers can't do that too, but you get my point. It was a total fiasco ran by an egomaniac who'd rather go to the bottom of the sea or go to space than actually learn how to make a good game in the modern era. That's just the reality. And as I said before, this probably needs a video in its own right, as most of these do. But we need to continue on because it's about to get much, much worse than Richard Garriott. Camelot Unchained. According to its Kickstarter, Camelot Unchained is a counter-revolutionary realm versus realm focused MMORPG from Mark Jacobs, set in a post-apocalyptic and yet familiar world. Mark Jacobs is a legendary game designer known for making Warhammer Online, Dark Age of Camelot, and Warhammer Online and Dark Age of Camelot. Did I mention that Mark Jacobs also made Dark Age of Camelot? I'm going to hold back on my commentary a bit on this one because Mark Jacobs is known for both being a horrible human being, allegedly, and also being known to be very litigious to small YouTubers with strikes. Jacobs also helped pioneer an infamous tactic that we've seen in other games before and we'll see in other games after this, such as Pantheon Rise of the Fallen and Chronicles Valyria, and also, to some extent, the day before. Even though the day before isn't on this list because it's too soon. It's too soon! where the team take Kickstarter money to either fund an unreleased game or deliver a game radically different than the one was promised. 
In this case, it was Ragnarok Colossus. The team claimed it would be based on the Camelot Unchained engine, and according to developers, somehow developing this new game would somehow make Camelot Unchained more successful and better funded. It's largely impossible for me while making this video to research this in detail without going into the legal documents and going into the Wayback Machine because all of the obvious stuff that you can find is just drama of people hating on Mark Jacobs for being a terrible human being. And I think with that, we're going to have to leave this. Safe to say, Camelot Unchained is not coming out anytime soon, if it ever will, and the scandals surrounding the game are probably more famous than the game itself will ever be. And with that, now we return to an old friend. Pantheon Rise of the Fallen. Hello, Pantheon, my old friend. I've come to complain about you again. I've made multiple videos on Pantheon Rise of the Fallen as it slowly falls. You see what, you see what I did? I see what I did there. Pantheon, though, taught me something super important about YouTube when I made my initial video on it early on in the lifespan of this channel. My initial video on Pantheon had a 10% like to dislike ratio. But as I was seemingly not in the cult and I knew what would happen, that video now sits at an 80% like to dislike ratio. Why? Because of the actions of the developer of the game. I'm not psychic. I just saw what the developers of Pantheon were doing. I got suspicious and I made a video on it reporting the facts. And now those facts look pretty good in my favor. And that's just what happens when you make a good YouTube video. In fact, I think that's still the video on this channel that I'm the most proud of because I just spent a lot of time researching it and it just turned out that a lot of the criticisms I made were correct. But anyways, for those of you that don't know what we're talking about, you should check out my other videos on Pantheon because I've made several. But let me give a brief summary here. The Pantheon was founded well back in the early 2010s with Brad McQuaid, the director of EverQuest, leading the project. However, the game more or less went dark over the previous decade with alpha testing for its most high-tier $1,000 and plus backers who seem to make up a large amount of my subscribers on this channel as well. The world's so crazy. Then, recently, the developers Visionary Realms attempted to do a Mark Jacobs and attempt to change the art style of the game, flip the game into a survival extraction game in order to both release something, in order to avoid lawsuits, and just try and get out of the hole that they dug themselves into. The blowback was so massive, partly due to videos like mine, I'll take a little bit of credit for that, I think I had one of the most popular videos on YouTube criticizing Pantheon, other than by big people like Narek and stuff like that. Anyways, stop talking about yourself, old man Banjo. Pantheon. Pantheon, it didn't go well. Sadly, a lot of people blame the failure of the game on the death of Brad McQuaid, one of the most impactful game designers, at least on my life and a lot of other people's, back when he passed away unexpectedly in 2019. I don't know, and I don't think any of us can know who haven't worked on the Pantheon project, whether or not Brad McQuaid's death is the reason that the game followed the pattern of every other Kickstarter MMORPG. For my own thoughts, I don't think that was the reason because, well, we've seen the pattern. All of these games do this. And I don't think Brad McQuaid, as much as I might like levels or things that he did back in 1999 for EverQuest, was going to save his Kickstarter from that. In the end, we'll never know, and that is a tragedy, but rest in peace, Brad McQuaid. And now moving on to the last and possibly most promising, but also most controversial game on our list, Ashes of Creation. So Ashes of Creation may be the most promising game on this list, depending on who you asked. The game was kickstarted back in 2016, so later in the area of early Kickstarter MMORPGs, to the tune of $3 million US dollars originally. And of all the games on this list, it has without any doubt attracted the most positive attention to this day. The selling point for the game is the dynamic PvE world. The general idea is that quest hubs in the world, unlike static quest hubs in theme park MMORPGs, grow in response to player activity, making the world more dynamic. The game has also displayed much better PvP netcode than other MMORPGs. If any of you have played large-scale MMORPGs that have large-scale PvP battles, you know that regardless of how much the developers work on them, in reality, with the reality of people's modems, internet, packet loss, and the world, this crap generally lags very badly. And uh, they've 
presumably worked very hard to solve this. I don't know whether they have. I haven't been involved in any of their alpha testing. The game is set to enter beta sometime later this year, which is interesting, but I think we'll have to wait and see. AOC, though, in my opinion is also one of the most controversial games on this list, as there are many content creators who I respect that have more or less turned their YouTube channels lately into hype machines for this game, and a lot of people seem to be staking their reputation on its success. And I definitely agree with them that Ashes of Creation looks better than everything else on this list. The latest information I can find states that the game will release with the $15 subscription model, though I think that may be up for debate now given inflation and it might be either higher or lower depending on how things go. But nonetheless, that's a very steep ask in the modern MMO market where a game like New World could barely maintain a player base and that was a buy-to-play game. I would be very shocked if Ashes of Creation manages to succeed as a subscription MMO in 2024. As we're far enough into the video now, and most people have probably clicked off, I'll go through my own opinion on Ashes of Creation and a lot of the people that think it's going to be somehow the future of MMORPGs. My personal opinion on Ashes of Creation is that most of the positivity around the game is due to YouTuber hype. If, I, if you actually watch the videos of the game without YouTuber commentary, and YouTubers that are better than me are very good at doing hype commentary, you'll notice the game actually doesn't look very good. It looks like a combination of some systems from Riff, some systems from uh, Final Fantasy XIV, and a lot of systems from Guild Wars 2, all combined into a game. And that's it. That's, that's about it. All for a subscription model, where most of those games other than Final Fantasy XIV don't have subscription models anymore. In the end, I think the hype around Ashes of Creation is more a feature of YouTubers covering the MMORPG space then it is a legitimately good game. We'll have to see. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. It would be great to play that. But one of the things that I've realized covering this space in my year of doing YouTube now is that one of the ways YouTubers seek to benefit themselves is they make a bunch of hype videos about something coming out and then people respond, oh my God, this is so cool. This is so hype. And uh, then when the thing it turns out to be bad, the same YouTuber can make videos bashing the thing and feeling ag aggrieved. Whereas if you make videos criticizing something when it's hyped, you get nothing out of the video. And then when the vi the um, game eventually turns out to be bad, people just go, oh, yeah, this guy this guy said it. But it's too late then. It doesn't benefit you. Uh, the, the YouTube algorithm just it promotes it promotes needless hype. That's just the way the Internet is. And that's sort of my cautious, cautious view on Ashes of Creation. But I could be completely wrong. Maybe it will do what Albion Online has done and actually become a niche, unique MMORPG that a lot of people can enjoy. I think we'll have to wait and see. Uh, if you watch this far into the video, please like and subscribe. I'm sorry, this video sort of got completely out of hand. I had no idea how much research was going to have to go into this video, and then I struggled to keep it in the time that I wanted it to do. In the future, I think I'll do more deep dives on each of these MMORPGs, explaining how they got to where they got, But because uh, it's really fascinating. It's, it's the best drama ever. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you enjoy this stuff and you enjoy my rants, like and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next video, guys. Peace.